so given that I only had 10 minutes, I wanted to just present one thought, one idea, and uh, hopefully it's somewhat thought-provoking and not too controversial, and that is the idea of building up versus building out strictly from a water quality perspective, okay? So it seems like many of you are environmental stewards here in this room, so you probably know that the pollution that's in the Huron River and in fact the pollution that's in most water bodies in the country comes from us, it comes from the landscape. It washes off the landscape, um, it's oils, uh, lubricants from our automobiles and metals and it's pesticides. In the summertime, it's, you know, this time of year, it's what? It's salt. There's a lot of that. And it's about ready to be unleashed. Um, and there's law and chemicals in the summer and it's, it's um, it, you know, pet waste, that sort of thing. So I think the technical terms are uh, grime and schmutz. <laughs> but assuming all that water was cleaned up, we still have the issue of how much of the water is running off the landscape and how fast it's running off the landscape. So that's what I wanted to uh, touch on. If you take a native Michigan forest or a prairie or even farmland that isn't, you know, overly drained and you pave it over, all of a sudden you have flipped the model. You have a landscape that used to import or uh, absorb all of the water that fell on it, almost all of it, 90% of it, 95% of it. And now you have about 95 to 100% runoff. So the volume difference is tremendous. So if you, if you have an average of 30 inches of rain in Michigan per year, you go from you know, 27 inches of that being absorbed to 27 inches of that being exported, and it happens like that. And it turns out that, well, if you're a, picture yourself as a creek, and you're the solid line. So when it rains, if you have a bunch of forest around you, you're going to sit and wait a little while before the water comes to you, and then you're going to gradually rise. And you're not going to rise that much, and it's going to stop raining, and you're going to gradually go back to your steady state. If you're a developed watershed, you're, you're a creek in a developed watershed, first of all, you're going to start off with this lower, lower line. You have less base flow. You don't have as much groundwater flow. When it rains, it's an urban area you're just going to get inundated. The water's going to come right at you. It's going to last for a very short period of time. As soon as it stops raining, it's going to go away. So it turns out that the percent imperviousness is directly correlated to stream health. So if you have a very uh, unimpervious watershed, if you have a naturalized watershed that's less than 5%, you're going to have uh, warm water fishery, cool water fishery. You're going to have a lot of diversity. You're going to have stability in your creek channel. It doesn't take much. You get above 10%, you start losing your trout population, your diversity plummets, you start to have erosion of stream banks. You have that flashiness in the creek channel. 10 to 20% is really, really rural densities. It's one acre zoning and less. Um, and then once you get over 20%, you start having heavily impacted streams where only things that can tolerate, only things that can find their own oxygen are going to live in that creek. And that's really suburban development. Urban development is even beyond that. So let's compare. Well, I mean, if you look at that, you think, OK, urban, bad, rural, good. Uh, you know, really rural, good for the creeks, because there's less imperviousness. You have healthy creeks. But if you look at it in terms of density or population served, let's look at Ann Arbor City apartments, which are being built uh, right down the road here. And um, this is 155 units. One and two bedroom. So if you figure there's 50% of each and there's one person per bedroom, I figure there's probably going to be about 233 people living on about a half an acre. And that density is 416 people per acre. So you have an area that's going to run off a lot of volume of water when it rains, but it's serving 416 people. Pittsfield Township in total, and I'm not picking on Pittsfield Township, this is just suburban versus urban. Um, if you look at the density, the density of Pittsfield Township right now is just under two people per acre. And it's 25% impervious, which is kind of surprising. I'm going to skip that one for in case we need to go back to it. So what I'd like to do is just compare these. If you take a look at Ann Arbor City Apartments, 
233 people, 416 people per acre. So if you want to figure out how much runoff you get from a one-inch storm event, it's a pretty simple calculation. There's a, there's a uh, factor that you use to turn it from an uh, area to a volume. And then there's how impervious it is. So it's, it's not quite 100% impervious because rooftop capture and you know, cracks in the sidewalk and that sort of thing. You get 95% imperviousness. And you have a half an acre. You multiply these three, you get 1,931 cubic feet of stormwater runoff from a one-inch storm event. And just for scale, that's about the size of one of those big uh, gas tankers that fill up at the gas fill up the tanks at the gas station. It's a little bit bigger than that. So that's a lot of runoff for a half an acre. But if you look at Pittsfield Township, excuse me, Pittsfield Township, if you take that same 0.56 acres, it only runs off about a quarter of that volume because it's less impervious, right? but it serves one person instead of 233. If you were to take the 233 people that are going to live in Ann Arbor City Apartments and you put them out in that density and the same imperviousness that you have in Pittsfield Township, they would take up 461 acres and the runoff for the one inch storm would be 388,000 cubic feet. So it's about a 200 time di times um, difference. So that's, that's the, the one point I'm trying to make. Uh, this isn't a judgment. I know this is, you know, there's a, a conversation going on in Ann Arbor about, um, you know, how tall should buildings be? What's the floor area ratio? Do we want canyons uh, for streets? Do we want to maintain that small town feel? Do we want outside developers building you know, and then leaving town. Um, I'm not making a judgment on any of that. I'm just comparing these two different points. Cities are more efficient when it comes to, if we're going to build and we're going to drive and we're going to have sidewalks and rooftops, um, we're going to have runoff. Cities are more efficient on a per capita basis in terms of water quality. And the, the extreme scale of this is New York City, our most dense urban environment, has over 8 million people in it. And that's just the city boundaries itself. It's not the metropolitan area. Now, you can figure that if there is any creeks, or there are any creeks remaining in the five boroughs in New York, they're probably not in very good shape. They're probably heavily impacted. But they serve about a quarter of the population of Canada. So if you put four New York cities in a row, you'd have that population of Canada in a very small geographic area those creeks in that area would be blasted. They'd be heavily impacted. They would support very little life, certainly no diversity. But the rest of the square miles of Canada, however many hundreds of thousands that is, or the US, um, would have creeks that are less than 5 or 10% impervious, and they would be healthier. So. Um, the, the impact of New York is heavy, but if you look at the, uh, the linear foot of creek that are basically impaired per capita, it's a very efficient, that urban land use is a very efficient use in terms of protecting water quality overall, broadly. Thank you.